All right, here we are, In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. This is lesson number four, entitled Holy Sex, and this is part one of Holy Sex. Well, let's face it, um, you can't have a course on love and marriage without a discussion about the role of sex in that relationship, impossible. I mean, we could do a lot of different lessons on, on, on different topics, but eventually we need to talk about the subject of sex. Now, since uh, I'm neither a marriage counselor nor a sex therapist, I'm a preacher, I'm not going to be discussing this topic from a, you know, a kind of a dysfunctional or mechanics uh, perspective. For example, um, you know, the psychological reasons why a woman uh, or a man has stopped having sex or perhaps is attracted to a certain type of sex act. I, I'm not going to be discussing those type of things in this session. And I also will not be discussing the mechanics of sex, you know, how to improve your sex life. That's something that uh, I need to leave to uh, those that uh, do counseling on a professional level. As the title of this lesson indicates, however, I want to examine the spiritual nature of human sexuality. Now learning the meaning of holy sex will give you not only a, you know, a better appreciation for sex and, and one another in a marriage, it'll also help you see God's role in the experience of oneness and intimacy that sex creates. So there's a legitimate discussion here about holy sex that has uh, nothing to do with the mechanics or the dysfunction that may occur in a relationship. Okay, I, I, I want to voice a, a question that many of you may already be thinking or will surely be thinking before long in this particular class during the sessions where we're talking about human sexuality and sex and marriage. And that is uh, the question, if God really did create sex, and if he did give it to married couples as a special gift, why is sex such a struggle? You know, I, I rarely see couples who have a lousy marriage but great sex, and conversely, uh, a wonderful marriage and lousy sex. You know, sex is not always the cause of marriage problems, but it's a, a very often the indicator of how satisfying and happy the marriage is in general. So sex is a very important component uh, to, the, uh, to the marriage union, and there's often a lot of you know, struggle about it uh, in, the, uh, in the couple. Now I believe that part of the reason we struggle so much with uh, sex in marriage is because of what we've been taught about it over the centuries, especially within Christianity. Uh, in the last thousand years or so, there have been some major changes in attitudes about the role and the meaning of sex within marriage. For example, when I say the first generation, you, know, you go back a thousand years or so, uh, especially in the Roman Catholic perspective, there was a time when the Roman Catholicism was the major expression of Christianity in the world. And during that time, people viewed sex, especially the pleasurable part of sex, as uh, not much more than a necessary evil in the need to procreate as was commanded in Genesis chapter 1 verse 22. Um, then we, uh, we changed, we had a change with time several centuries later. We came to the understanding that um, uh, uh, pleasure in sex is God-given and therefore blessed by God within the marriage. Now this probably had a lot to do with the Protestant Reformation and because of the Protestant Reformation uh, a greater number of clergymen who could now marry. And so their marital experiences brought greater clarity and understanding to their view of the subject of sex uh, and the Bible. And so with time as I say uh, people began to see that uh, God was blessing this activity within marriage. And then the modern generation has come to the conclusion that since God blesses sex, we should use every tool, every technology to embrace this wonderful gift so as to maximize its pleasure. Now the problem here is that even though the inhibitions and false information about sex 
are pretty much gone you know, within modern Christianity, there's still a, a tremendous amount of struggle and pain and dysfunction within Christian couples, all couples, but even within Christian couples. You know, with all this freedom and technology, many couples think you know, there's still something missing in their uh, intimate sexual lives. Well, the latest thinking uh, in this area uh, can be summarized in the phrase meta-sex. Now I said meta-sex, not mega-sex, meta-sex. The word meta from the Greek means beyond, beyond the usual. And so meta-sex refers to the idea of beyond the usual experience of sex. Now the thinking is that God designed sex to be more. God designed sex to, you know, to go beyond the idea that it's simply you know, a fun thing for married people to do while they're having babies. You know, there's more to it than that. And so God designed sex to be an encounter with the divine. No other experience is like it. It is otherworldly and it is this way, uh, it is this way rather, to give us a glimpse into the only other world that exists, and that is the heavenly uh, world, the spiritual dimension, if, uh, if you will. So if this is so, then sex is holy, as our title suggests. Sex is sacred. Sex is not only a pathway to be one with our spouse, it is also a way to experience oneness with God. This is the kind of the latest thinking about uh, human sexuality within marriage among Christians. Now there, these are you know, lofty ideals, they're challenging goals, but the research does confirm that as we grow in our understanding that sex is a God-given holy event, we also grow in the level of love for our mate and our satisfaction within marriage. So let's take a look at this idea of sex as a holy thing. Um, it is holy for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's holy because it was created by a holy God. And you need to notice also that it was created by the holy God before sin entered the world to corrupt it. You know, there was sex before there was sin. So it is a holy thing. And like everything else, sex was created perfect and spiritually pure from the beginning and was then corrupted when sin entered the world. Sex is holy also because God designed it to be one of His special experiences. You know, think about the Jewish people, if you wish, as you read about them in the Bible. The Jews, you know, they designed houses and monuments and so on and so forth. But God personally designed the Ark of the Covenant. Therefore, the Ark of the Covenant became holy. See what I'm saying? The Jewish people, they designed houses and, and various things in their society where they live, but God was the one that gave them the Ark. God was the one that gave them the temple. So the things that God designed, those things were holy. Those things were set apart. Well, in the same way, man acts out in many different ways. But sexual activity was specifically designed by God. Therefore, it is holy by design. And so to have a, a spiritual meaning as opposed to the other human actions that don't have a spiritual meaning. You know, we go to work, we travel, we enjoy, we hunt, we fish. We do all kinds of things in life that are not necessarily holy. Things that we do that we can be thankful for that God has given us. But God hasn't specifically designed you know, how we fish for, you know, for catfish or how we go hunting or how we you know, enjoy going for a drive in the country or whatever. You know, God didn't design these things specifically. He created the environment for it and we enjoy it and we give thanks. But He did design human sexuality and by virtue of the fact that He designed human sexuality, human sexuality therefore has a a holy nature, a holy significance. Then we can say that sex is holy because God set it apart for a specific purpose, 
that He decreed. Just like the temple or the tabernacle was designed by God and then put aside for a special purpose, thus making it holy, in the same way, human sexuality was designed by God and it was a set aside for a specific purpose. And there are several purposes, actually, not just one purpose, but several purposes that God set human sexuality aside for. For example, um, uh, one of the purposes is that he, to uh, create the one flesh experience between a man and a woman in Genesis 1 verse 24, and they will become one flesh. How do they become one flesh? Not by shaking hands. Not by saying, you're my wife, I'm your husband. No, you know, even in the Bible at the beginning, they became one flesh because they were sexually united in that flesh. This is why sex between men and other men, or women and other women, or any other combination other than the one man and one woman within the confines of marriage, this is why these other types of sex uh, are sinful. Uh, they're sinful because they don't use sex in its original and uh, holy purpose. Oh, there can be affection and sexual experience that is pleasurable in these other unions. You know, if you were to say to someone who is gay, oh, you don't really enjoy that type of sexuality, well, you'd be wrong. Or if you said to someone who uh, is gay, you don't really love that other person that you're with, you know, if it's a man or a woman, you don't really love that person, it's not real love, you, you would be wrong. You, know, you would be wrong. They love, you know, this man will love this other man or this woman will love this other woman and they will have pleasure in their union. You, you know, that's the wrong argument to use to uh, deny this as uh, an, acceptable, an acceptable function. The thing that I'm saying here about these type of unions is that they are not holy in God's eyes because they are not pursued for His purpose. God is the one who designed sex and God is the one who gave the various purposes for this design. And one of the purposes that He didn't design it for is for men to enjoy it with other men and women to enjoy it with other women or for three women to enjoy it with one man and all those other combinations. So making something lawful, even making it acceptable to society, does not necessarily make it holy. And so you know, gay marriage, for example, may become, well, it is becoming the law in many states, may even become the law of the land. And uh, it may even become acceptable. You know, they're doing polls and so on and so forth, and we find out that you know, uh, 20 years ago, only 20% of people accepted the idea of gay marriage. Today, uh, you know, 60% of people maybe, or 58% of people, and maybe in 20 years from now, 80% of people will find you know, gay marriage acceptable. You know, and, and there might not be much that we can do about that. But one thing it'll never be is that it will never be holy in God's eyes, because God established human sexuality to be used between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. It's only holy if it's done according to God's plan and for His purpose. So God set the sexual experience apart for the purpose of creating oneness in marriage between one man and one woman. Nothing has changed that. That continues to be God's purpose. He also set it apart for another reason, and that was to represent the relationship between Christ and His church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. God designed the tabernacle, for example, in the Old Testament, and He designed the ark and the other objects that were used in worship, and He did this to uh, represent the process of salvation. In other words, the sacrificing of animals and the sprinkling of blood on the ark and the tablets of the law and the separation of the outer and the inner rooms of the, um, of the uh, tabernacle itself, all these things were objects that God used to teach man the story and the meaning of his work with Christ. They were a shadow of the things 
to come. They were a preview of the things to come. Now all of these things, the sacrificing and the tabernacle and then eventually the temple and all of the activity and all of the objects that were used there were, were simply uh, previewing the real thing that was to come. And the real thing that was to come, of course, was Jesus sacrificing His blood that fulfilled the law, that removed the curtain or the obstacle that prevented the common man entry into the presence of God. And so in the Old Testament and even uh, as we read about the temple during Jesus' times, these objects, they were holy because God used them to teach a special truth about what He was doing and the truth about man's true condition and need for a Savior. So everything in that system was designed specifically to teach spiritual truths. Well, I say this in order to make this point. Sex is holy because God uses it in a marriage to represent another eternal truth. And that other eternal truth is the reality of the intimate relationship that Christ has with His church and will be fulfilled when He comes. So before the beginning of time, God planned the eventual relationship between the church and her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before the beginning of time, God set aside the oneness in marriage achieved through the sexual union to represent in physical terms what was true and what was present in spiritual terms. Okay? This is why adultery, for example, is sinful. Why God hates divorce, for example. Why the roles of wives and husbands and children are clearly explained so that the marriage, the biblical model of marriage, will reflect accurately what God originally designed it for and what it is supposed to represent with Christ and His church. So you see what, I, see what I'm trying to get at here? It's not just about sex, it's not just about doing this and that, it's about fulfilling in our marriages the physical example of what God has already established in the spiritual realm between Christ and His church. That's why we say sex is a holy thing, that marriage also is a holy th thing. God also set uh, human sexuality apart, more common reason now that we know, for procreation. Genesis 1 verse 28. You know, you ever think about this? God could have designed us in such a way that we could procreate in a much simpler and less involving way. I mean, everything that goes into making a baby, you know, I think God could have done it you know, in a more simple fashion. But conceiving children is a direct result of the experience of sex within marriage. It is tied to the experience of oneness by the couple. So you know, we can produce children in other ways, but not all of these ways are holy in the way that they reflect God's design. One of the reasons why uh, I don't believe that you know, a woman, uh, for example, can, uh, you know, can be impregnated by a man, you know, use his sperm and her egg, this, that's not his wife, that's a surrogate, and then she'll have a baby for that couple. Uh, they have all good intentions and so on and so forth, but I, I see this as a violation of that holiness, if you wish. We're not going by the original design that God has in mind. We, you know, we can get around what God says. We can disobey, we can change the design if we want, which we are doing. But if we want to maintain the holiness aspect of marriage, then we have to maintain also the design that God has given us for that holy marriage. And finally, he set uh, sexuality apart for worship, believe it or not. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 18, you know, Paul says, in everything give thanks. So just as the appearance of the burning bush filled Moses with awe and devotion, a true experience of the oneness that God designed sex to produce in marriage can lead us to a sincere and heartfelt sense of gratitude and praise for this wonderful gift that He has given us. Now don't get me wrong, 
I'm not saying that having sex is worship. Okay? So let's not leave here thinking, oh, you know, the teacher said that having sex is worship. I'm not saying that. You know, the pagans, they used sexual activity in their worship and rituals out of a distorted reasoning that offering and sharing this otherworldly experience would somehow please the gods. Now we know what God wants of us in public and corporate worship and how we're to conduct ourselves so that we don't fall into this particular trap. What I am saying is that this powerful experience, when used to create oneness in marriage, can lead us to a greater and worshipful appreciation of God who gave us this gift in the first place. You know, if sex is wonderful and you feel grateful for the experience, don't be afraid to thank God. He gave the experience for that very reason, that you might lift your heart up to Him in joy and thanksgiving. It's okay to say thank you God for a wonderful sexual uh, encounter with your spouse. So this idea you know, that sex is holy because of its creator and its design and its purpose, this was not always taught in the church or in society. As I said before, in the past, we've been taught that sex is essentially evil and only tolerated by God for procreation. Many of us who come out of the Catholic heritage has, have been taught that. And much of this, of course, as I say, stemmed from this Roman Catholic teaching, uh, specifically of Augustine, who taught that the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden was actually sexual awareness and that sinfulness was passed on from generation to generation through human sexuality. That was his thinking. The original sin, you know, it got handed down from generation to generation through the sexual act, so therefore there must be something wrong with the sexual act. That's the kind of thinking that eventually developed the idea that, well, sex is not really a good thing, it's only tolerated within marriage, and then only if people are trying to have children. The uh, early Protestant reformers took a softer view describing sex within marriage as disorderly at best. And of course today, thankfully, today we've come around to the attitude that says we shouldn't be afraid to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. Actually, Alan Gardner, Dr. Alan Gardner, who wrote a book called Sacred Sex, uh, uh, gave that quote, I thought it was terrific. I mean, we shouldn't be afraid to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. If God is not ashamed and He gave us human sexuality, we shouldn't be ashamed of talking about it. And especially in church, some people say, wow, they're talking about sex in church. I mean, we have the right to talk about sex because God, God is the one who invented it and gave it to us. Of course we need to talk about human sexuality. So in this lesson today, and of course the next one, uh, I want to examine that relationship God intended between sexuality and spiritual awareness and spiritual experience. That's, that's where I want to. I don't want to talk about you know, technical things or uh, difficulties. I want to talk about the relationship uh, between human sexuality and human spirituality, the deeper meaning of sex. Now, we're not the only ones that are re-examining human sexuality in order to find you know, a deeper and spiritual significance. A lot of people in the world are exploring the same territory to see if there's more to sex than just the physical, to see if there is some sort of spiritual component as well. Um, for example, a lot of people are you know, looking at this, but a lot of times their mistake is that they try to find the spiritual component by manipulating the physical aspects of the experience. Okay? This heightened awareness that they're thinking of, that they confuse with spirituality, they try to um, artificially, uh, artificially create this spiritual awareness through uh, different types of drugs or techniques or pornography or paraphernalia or various partner combinations, all done to heighten the pleasure, thinking that this will reveal some sort of deeper meaning, uh, deeper worlds uh, that they can find. Now as in all things, as Christians, we believe that Christ is the key and He is the way and 
Uh, he is the conduit, if you wish, to higher and deeper knowledge in all things. And it is no different here when we're talking about human sexuality. You see, in Christ, we learn about the true God. We learn about the truth of His word and the truth about ourselves. And we learn everything about ourselves, including our sexual selves. Now in this context, the holy essence of sexual experience is revealed because it is only in the sexual union of both male and female that the full image of God is represented. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying? Let's look at a passage in Genesis, I'll try to explain this a little more clearly. In Genesis chapter one, verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Now if you look at this passage, you see that it's not Adam that is in the image of God, and it's not Eve that's in the image of God. It's Adam and Eve as one, sexually arrived at as one, that together are in the true image of God. And so the Godhead, right? The Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead's image is reflected in Adam and Eve when they are in one flesh. You see how things are working here? You know, divinity has a dynamic fusion, three in one. Well, humanity also has a dynamic fusion, two into one. So let's make a, a kind of a math syllogism out of this idea, shall we? If oneness equals the image of God, right? Because we're made, you know, they were made in His image. Adam and Eve were made in Him. How do, how do, how do Adam and Eve you know, together? Well, oneness. When Adam and Eve are one, they are actually in the image of God. So if oneness equals the image of God, and if sex is how we arrive at that oneness in God, then sex equals the image of God. This is the basis of the spiritual component of human sexuality. It's not what or how intensely you feel, and that's what happens in the world. All the things that are happening in the world are trying to heighten the feeling that people have when they have sex. Did you have good sex? Did you have bad sex? Well, it depends how you feel. But this is not the basis of the spiritual component in human sexuality. Not what or how intensely you feel, but what the total experience is supposed to represent. So we're never more like the way God created us. We're never truer to the image that He created us in than when we are pursuing oneness in marriage and human sexuality is the primary interaction designed by God to create and maintain this oneness. Okay, somebody might say, so what? You know, what's, what's that got to do with anything? Nice, you know, nice thought up there, but how does that affect me? How, how can that help me in any way? You know, we talked about at the beginning, why is there so much struggle in sex? So what we've talked about here, how will that help me? Okay, we're like God when we're one and we become one primarily through sexual union, so? Well, so this truth can serve you in a variety of ways. For example, this truth reveals the true role of human sexuality within marriage. Not just for pleasure or release or to have children or to bargain or to have some sort of power. God designed human sexuality to be used to create oneness. This is its ultimate purpose and we know we've achieved good sex when this goal is reached. You see, the oneness comes before the pleasure. If all you shoot for in human sexuality is pleasure, it's simply a case of diminishing return. 
like anything else that gives pleasure. You like ice cream? Well, that first chocolate ice cream, well, that was great. You know, I'll have another, I'll have another. Pretty soon, you know, yeah, chocolate ice cream, whatever. Maybe I should start another flavor. And that's what happens with human sexuality. We're always shooting for pleasure. We think that's the ultimate goal. And it's human nature. Eventually it declines. What I'm saying to you is God designed us in such a way that we should use human sexuality to aim for oneness. And it's that oneness that will help us maintain the pleasure that we have in that relationship, in that activity. Okay? Number two, how does it help us? How does this understanding help us? It frees us. This truth frees us from the guilt and discomfort that many feel about sex, even in marriage. You know, sex in marriage is a God-given thing. It's a God-blessed thing and therefore it's, it's a holy thing. So this knowledge gives us freedom to pursue and enjoy the aspect of marriage, or this aspect of marriage, to the fullest without fear or shame. God has given us sex, we have a purpose to fulfill with it. The purpose is to find oneness, to become intimate with one another. God wants us to do this. And so we are free within marriage to pursue that in any way that we want to. And then thirdly, this truth opens our eyes to the pathway of personal fulfillment and that is of course in marriage. You know, I hear people always say, well, I, I want to find myself. I want to, you know, I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to find myself. Or I, I want to get myself together. Or I want to feel more fulfilled. So what do they do? They travel or they become more promiscuous or worse still, they divorce their partners in search of a new love. The Bible says that the complete person is the one who is complete in Christ spiritually. Colossians 1 verse 28 and complete emotionally and physically, <clears throat> excuse me, when one with another person in marriage, Genesis 1 verse 27. And why is this so? Because spiritual fulfillment can only be experienced in Christ and at resurrection ultimately. And because of physical and emotional fulfillment can only be fully experienced when we realize the image in which we've been created that is in marriage. You see what I'm getting across here? We look for pleasure when we ought to be looking for oneness because when we get oneness, we find satisfaction. And when we have satisfaction, we're able to enjoy whatever level of pleasure that human intimacy can bring us. All right, that you are in this class actually means that you are still seeking both of these things simultaneously. All right, well that's you know, an opening discussion about holy sex. Uh, next week we're going to ask the question, is all sex holy? And we're going to explore the true mystery of human sexuality. I give you homework sometimes, something to read, so on and so forth. This week I want you in your marital lives and your marital in intimacy to pursue and discuss and think about this oneness idea instead of pleasure or satisfaction. A good discussion, a good discussion and an intimate discussion, an important and serious discussion that all husbands and wives should have one with another. Well, thank you for uh, your attention. We'll pick up this class next week in lesson number five.